Hi, everybody. John Sporn here. Welcome to this week's edition of Wine Uncensored. So this week, we're going to do a little bit different than what I'm normally done, and we're going to look at sparkling wines. Um, this is something that, of course, is popular all the time, but especially during the holiday season. There's so many great holidays around um, that a lot of people just want to pop open a bottle of bubbly um, and enjoy yourselves. Um, I know a lot of people I've been talking to are looking for some special bottles to crack open on New Year's Eve this year. Um, so that we can say farewell once and for all to 2020 and move on to 2021. So um, if you have any questions as we're going on, please pop them in. I'm going to be talking about sparkling wines um, kind of in general, um, how they're made and um, the different methods and then the different um, types that are available out there in the marketplace. Um, so this, um, this picture here is, is, a, is a, a picture of champagne. I can tell you we took this um, in London, we were waiting for a plane and um, we just uh, had such a great time. We uh, got a couple of glasses of champagne to toast farewell to London um, and hopefully we'll be back soon enough to um, try it again. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, this is Dom Perignon. Come quickly, I am drinking the stars. So um, legend is, has it that he is the one that um, invented champagne, as you will. Um, he was certainly hired uh, by the Abbey in, in the Champagne region to come and investigate um, a problem they were having with their wines. Um, they would make the wines and they were well, very well known for making Chardonnays. Um, the, the, the kings of France were drinking them because Achrims is right there, um, of course, in Champagne. So the, the, they were used to um, drinking the wines from that region. Um, but what would happen is that the monks would make the wines um, and during the year, um, especially um, in the springtime, the bottles would explode and um, they were killing off the monks and, and the sisters and this was not a good thing. So um, they brought in Dom Perignon to do some investigation to try to figure out why are these bottles exploding. Um, so his, his quote here is actually comes several hundred years later um, as they in, uh, investigated where this quote came from. So it occurred after his death, but it's still widely attributed to him. Um, but he is the, the monk that kind of discovered what was happening with uh, the wines that they were making. And that's uh, something that we call now the method ancestral. And we'll go through that in just a moment. But I know you're thirsty. You've had a long, hard week. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the Prosecco. Um, so I didn't give any specific wines out for this, this um, presentation because I wanted you to just go and, and go ahead and get your favorite um, Proseccos, Cavas, and Champagnes. So um, I'm going to open mine up here now. It's hopefully, it's, there we go. Um, so I'm having um, a Borasca. Uh, oops. See if I can get that on the screen. Okay, so this is the cava that we're drinking, or the, I'm sorry, the prosecco that we're drinking here tonight. Uh, so let me pour some out here. Um, so prosecco is made um, in Italy, um, and it's actually made in the prosecco region of Italy. Um, there is a very um, up in the northern part of Italy in the vent near Venice in the Vento. Um, there's this region and you can see it here on on your screen that the green uh, area is Prosecco and you can make Prosecco anywhere in that region. Um, but then there are special Proseccos. Um, they have the DOCs and then you have the DOCGs. Um, and, you know, if you if you remember back um, on the different um, types of uh, ratings, you know, the DOC is kind of the general, which means if you have a, a Prosecco DOC, um, that means that it's guaranteed that all the grapes are coming from that region and there's a certain level of quality there. Um, but as you go up that pyramid, you start getting more and more um, specific into the types of wines that you can make. And so you have the um, the, the DOCGs, the, the uh, Caliancho uh, Val, Valdoblarente, Dene. Sorry, I know I'm going to mess up these names, so I apologize in advance. Um, so these are much smaller. So they, you know, there's only 15 communes that can make that, um, and then um, it goes up from there to the um, Rivas. So these are wines from a specific commune. So we would think of it 
the, the, a kind of a parallel is going to be um, vineyard specific, but um, all the vineyards have to be in this one little um, village. And so um, they they make these specific air, specific wines. Um, and so these are kind of like a vineyard specific um, Prosecco. And then at the top of the, of the um, pyramid is the um, Sopria de Cartesi. Um, and so this is a very special region. Um, it, it stays a little bit warmer than the rest of the Prosecco region, just because of the way the mountains are laid out. Um, a lot of the grapes come from higher elevations, so they don't get um, the, the coolness as everything. Um, and then you'll get all of that um, different um, uh, brighter notes in there. And the ones at the top of the pyramid are also vintage specific. Um, so they do have vintages in there, but they're still all made in the Charmat method. So um, let's talk a little bit um, about history and then we'll get into the Charmat method. So um, while you're drinking your Prosecco, we'll go through this. Uh, Kirsten wants me to do um, a, a sabering technique to open up a bottle. Um, maybe once it warms up and I can go outside, it's not gonna do well in the house at the moment, but we'll see what we can do once it warms up here. So here's a picture of King James, um, you know, King of England. Um, he was um, having a little trouble with um, the Spanish. You know, they were having battles um, as, you know, England and, and Spain and France often did during that time. Um, and of course, you also know King James of um, the King James Bible. He's the one that had it translated into English, out of, from Latin to English. Um, so the King James Bible is um, still, um, you know, one of the biggest sellers today. But he, with these wars that he was having with um, Spain and, um, uh, and um, France, uh, he wanted to build more warships. And so in order to build more warships, he needed wood. And so what he did is that he forbade um, the chopping down of force to make into charcoal. Um, and charcoal was used to light the fires that, were, that went into making bottles. Um, and the bottles were very, very important um, for the wine, right? Because you would store your uh, wine in the bottles um, and they would um, age and, you know, you, then you can ship them and it makes it a little bit easier. But the, um, since he needed this wood to build his uh, warships, he had to, f uh, everybody else had to figure out, well, what do we do to um, keep the glass industry going and, and uh, you know, staying warm if you can't make charcoal and, and, and burn the wood? So that's when coal really started um, to become mined in England. Um, England had a, a huge amount of, of charcoal, uh, I'm sorry, of coal. And so they were able to use those to, to um, burn the fires. And coal burns at a much, much higher temperature than charcoal does. This enabled the glass um, blowers to make glass that was much thicker. And this would become very important as we moved into trying to figure out how we're gonna keep champagne from killing the monks and the sisters um, in, in the Abbey. Is what Don Pignon figured out was that there was this fermentation going on in the bottle, a second fermentation, that it would go dormant during the winter because it would be too cold and the yeast would just go dormant. But once it started warming up in the spring, suddenly um, the yeast would start becoming active again. And if you remember from our previous shows, you know that, uh, yeast, they eat the sugar that's in the, in the grape juice, um, and then out the other end comes carbon dioxide and alcohol. And of course, you want the, the um, alcohol in the wine, because that's what makes it wine. But then the carbon dioxide, you know, for most still wines, you don't want it. It, go, it gets, um, evaporates off, you know, you have open fermenters, the carbon dioxide goes away. But if you keep it in a bottle and it keeps fermenting, you get pressure built up in the bottle. Um, which is what leads to making a champagne. But during Dom Perignon's time, um, the glass was so weak that when the pressure would build up, they would just explode. Um, so you can imagine bottles exploding um, in the cellar, you know, as the monks were in there. Um, and of course there's flying glass and, you know, um, things going at quite a high pressure um, and monks were dying. So because of King James trying to make more warships, we, we were able to get the glass blowers to start using coal, which were able to make thicker glasses, uh, bottles, um, which allowed um, the champagne to stay in the bottle without 
it exploding. So if you, you know, if you look at some of these bottles, they're much heavier than your normal wine bottle, right? If you look at a Bordeaux bottle, it's not nearly as heavy as um, any of the sparkling wine bottles. And that's because they have to be reinforced in order to keep the pressure from uh, exploding out. And Sir Kelham Digby is the one who actually figured out how to put these bottles together. Um, so he's the one that, that uh, learned to blow the, the glass, use the coal, burn, burn thicker glass. And so we're able to actually get a lot more um, pressure in a bottle without it exploding. So as Dom Perignon figured this out, he said, okay, now we know what's going on. It's these bottles that are, keep exploding and we're gonna be able to now, you know, um, make better wines um, without the bottles exploding because we can get better glass. And so now we can put those in, the, in these new bottles um, and they would still use the cork and they would tie it up. And that's how um, sparkling wines uh, truly began when they weren't by accident. Um, I'll come, before we go to that one, I'm gonna skip ahead really quick here because I wanted to show you something that got skipped. Uh, I got rid of that slide for some reason, I guess, sorry. Okay, so let's go on to talk about the next wine that we're gonna be looking at. Um, and this is Cava. So the Prosecco is made in what we call a Charmat method. Um, and this is a tank method. And so instead of having fermentation in the bottle, the fermentation is done in the um, tank. And so um, let's, actually, let's go through the whole row, the whole uh, lineup of, of sparking wine. So you're gonna start with making normal wine. You know, you go through your harvest and you pick your grapes, you put them in a fermenting tank and you're gonna make a still wine. It can be a Chardonnay, it can be a Pinot Noir, um, Pinot Meunier. So these are the, the three big grapes that are used in Champagne. Um, Cava uses um, those three grapes as well as several of the native grapes, Chirello. Um, so they can also make that there. In Prosecco, they use Glera. <clears throat> Excuse me. So whatever grape you're, gonna, you're good using, you go ahead and you just make a wine out of it, make a still wine. Now, when you harvest, you tend to harvest um, maybe a little bit earlier because you want really high acidity. You don't want so much the sweetness because if you think about it, you know, um, sparking wines generally don't have a high level of alcohol. They're fairly moderate. Um, so therefore, they will have um, the more acidity, which will help um, help them age. And that's what, you know, when you drink a lot of sparkling wines, you're always getting that acidity. You feel it on the sides of your mouth. Um, and so, you know, if you take a sip, you should be getting that acidity in there. So once your wines are fermented in um, the normal way, then they're put into a bottle. And then that bottle um, is... Um, you put in a little bit more sugar and a little bit more yeast. It's called a triage, liquor de triage. And then you're gonna put a um, bottle cap on top of that bottle. Um, and it's a, it's a bottle cap, just like you would see um, on a beer or a, a, a Coke bottle or something like that. Um, and it's, it's a crown cap and it goes on there. Um, and then you're gonna let the, the yeast have a second fermentation. Um, in Prosecco, that second fermentation is done in a tank. So instead of putting it all in a bottle, they have big stainless steel tanks where they put in um, the wine that was already made, and then they put in more sugar and more yeast and let the tanks um, create what happens in the bottle, but it happens on a much bigger scale. Now, that doesn't mean you can't make really good Prosecco um, using or any sparkling wine using a Charmat method, you actually can um, because it's basically what goes into the the, the tank to, that makes it good or not, right? If you start off with something very good in the vineyard and you're making good wines out of it, it'll flow all the way through. Now there are things you can do to tweak it, you know, to help it out, um, but you know everything, all wines always start in the vineyard. So um, in the tank method, you know, it ferments in the in the big tank and then. Um, they have many of these tanks, you know, so depending on, on the size of the, of the Prosecco um, winery, um, you know, they may have one, they may have two, they may have a dozen of them. And so what they do is they're able to make the wine and keep it in the tank and keep it fresh. And what they do is they bottle it kind of on demand. So when they have somebody that wants to order the wine, they're able to then, you know, fill the bottles, they empty out a tank and fill up the bottles. And so you kind of get a much fresher 
um, fruitier kind of wine than you would get with some of the others that are fermented in the bottle. Um, so like for this Prosecco here, um, you know, it, it is a fruitier uh, um, wine. It um, still tastes very fresh. It, you know, it's meant to be drank fresh. Um, even some of the more reserved um, Proseccos, I'll go back here a second. Um, the more reserved Proseccos that do have vintages, they're still meant to be drank within a year or so of um, bottling. Um, but they do, just like with the regular Proseccos, they bottle those continuously um, on demand. And the labels will tell you, you know, um, depending on the, on the winery, they'll either tell you the year or they'll tell you the year and the month that the, the wine was actually bottled. So you can see how fresh it is. So these are the ones by doing it this way, you actually get um, a lower cost. So you're able to produce wines, um, you know, much more economically because you're doing it in the big tank as you are um, doing individual bottles because there's a lot more work in the individual bottles as you can imagine. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the next method. Any questions um, on the beginnings of Prosecco? Okay, let's move on to um, our next wine then. So let's talk about Cava. So Cava is from Spain. Um, and Spain, um, you know, there's not one particular region of Cava. Um, there's several different regions throughout the country that, that they are allowed to make Cava. So the DL Cava is not um, a contiguous um, area of land as you do find in Prosecco or in Champagne or other places. Um, but there are certain regions that are allowed to grow it. Now, most of it is coming from around the Penedes region. So uh, just southwest of Barcelona is where you will see most of the cavas coming from. Um, and that's certainly the, uh, I would say the best cavas come from that region. And that's actually where cava was started. Um, so when you, when you um, buy a cava, um, a lot of it comes from that region. Um, the other regions are, are fairly um, smaller production, so you may not actually see those in the States. Um, but, you know, if you go over to Spain, you can drink local cava um, if you're not around the Barcelona area. Now, until recently, um, cava, there was no um, different cavas. Everything was a cava. Um, but then there was some pushback by some of the smaller producers that were producing excellent, excellent um, sparkling wines, but they didn't want to call it cava because um, cava was known in the marketplace for being um, low priced. Um, I, I know you've seen the, the bottles in the grocery store. You can find a bottle of cava in grocery stores, you know, for under five bucks sometimes. Um, and some of the smaller producers didn't want to use the name cava. So they um, did not call it cava. They would just call it a sparkling wine. Then uh, a group of uh, eight or nine of them got together and decided, well, let's call it a corpinat. So they were, they were going to make up their own DO to um, kind of fight back against kava, but there was going to be requirements on the kava that, you know, where it was grown and what grapes were put into it. And there's certain aging and, you know, all those kind of things that we find on champagne. So in um, 2020, actually, um, earlier this year, uh, the, the D.O. Cava agreed to change their methods and their terminology to allow some of these Cavas now to have um, a designation to them. Now, this is past the D.O. Cava. It's waiting to pass um, through the Department of Agriculture, and then it'll go to the EU to get passed. But, you know, there's a, probably a fairly good chance it'll happen. Now, what happens um, with, with Cava now is that, um, let me get my little point of going. So um, right now, all kava is just called kava. But now with the, the new regulations, there's going to be several different styles. So you're going to have the kava de guarda. This is going to be the youngest one, but it's going to be aged nine months in the bottle. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So there's going to be this minimum aging now that you can't just, you know, put it in the bottle for a month and then sell it. So it's going to be a minimum of nine months if you want to call it kava de guarda. So you can look for this now as um, probably starting in 21, 22, as, as the as bottlings occur, you'll start seeing it um, here in the US. Um, if you're gonna keep your uh, cava in the bottle for 18 months or longer, you can call it cava de guarda superior. Um, and then there's three different breakouts in there. So if it's between 18 and 30 months, you can call it a reserva. And we've kind of gotten used to seeing that name on other wines. So that, you know, this is telling you that 
there's probably a better, um, you know, it's been in the bottle longer, it's been laying on the lees, um, which means it's gonna absorb some more of those flavors. Um, and of course, it's gonna be a smaller production. There's not gonna be, you know, millions and millions of bottles manufactured um, because you gotta hold on to these for a minimum of 18 months, you know, so this is gonna be probably two years after the harvest before you're gonna be able to buy them. If you're gonna hold it for 30 months, um, you can call it a Gran Reserva. Um, so that's going to be even more richer. And that's getting, um, you know, closer to the champagne style. Um, and then the champagne, is, uh, the 36 months, um, the Parje uh, Calificato, calificato um, is 36 months. Um, so that is similar to what champagne that must be laid down for 36 months on the lees. And so that's what develops that rich, rich flavors um, that you get, those baking spices and those um, brioche and yeast flavors that you'll get in a champagne. It's because they've been laying on the lees and you get all that yeast interacting um, for 36 months. Um, so you can imagine, you know, it's much better than the nine month that we have um, for the intro cava. Um, also, you're going to be able to tell that um, there's going to be a, the minimum age that the vineyards must be at least 10 years old in order to do this. So it's not going to be young grapes. It's going to be more mature vineyards and, and better grapes. Um, that will be well established. It's going to be a sustainability that if you want it to be Cava de Guadalajara, it also must be 100% organic. Um, and like I said, um, no more than 10,000 um, uh, kilos of grapes per hectare can be harvested. So this is getting it much more, um, more like a DOCG, um, where it's going to be very controlled over it. Um, so you can start looking for that. Um, you'll start seeing, if you're going to get one of the better ones, you'll start seeing this label on it, um, which means that it's, it's met all the approvals and it will be, um, it's going to be more expensive than your entry level cavas, of course, but just like champagne is more expensive um, than, than others, other sparkling wines, you're going to have that quality kind of guaranteed in there that there's certain minimum things, like we talked about, you know, the, the, the tonnage that they get per acre and the, um, uh, the number of, of, of um, years or months on the bottle and everything. So it's going to really add to the richness of the wine. So um, let me open up my cava here. Now, again, you know, these are fairly new requirements, very new, you know, about, um, I want to say about six months old. So we're not able to get these yet in the U.S. Um, so we'll have to watch for those as they start coming up. Um, we have had some corponats. You can occasionally find a corponat here in the U.S. Um, I've been fortunate enough that we were um, in Barcelona last year and we did do um, several corponat tastings and you can tell that they are a little bit richer. So um, for the cava, um, here's the one I'm doing, the, the Via Conchi. So let me try to get that label up here for you. See if you can see that. Trying to get the glare, there we go. Keep the glare off. Um, so again, this is a cava, um, it's a brute. We'll talk about brute and dry and extra dry in a little bit. Um, but this is, um, you know, another sparkling wine and it's made in the method champoinet, which means it's made in the method of champagne. So um, where the Prosecco was made in a Charmant method in a tank, um, cava is made in the bottle just like champagne is. Now, um, like I said, in cava, they are allowed to use Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, um, and you do find that in a lot of the um, cavas that are available in the U.S., but you can also find it made with native grapes, and, you know, um, this, uh, the Trello is, is um, very good, and, and the wines adds a lot of acidity to it. Um, and so you can find those, they're not as popular in the US, but you can find them here in the US as well. So, and if you have the two different glasses and you smell them side by side, you, you'll see that there's, um, in the Prosecco, you're gonna get much more fruity aromatics, um, some floral notes in there. Whereas on the cava, you're going to get more of those baking spices. It's not going to be nearly as rich as, as when we get to the champagne, but you can tell that there is developed more um, because it's, it's laid down for longer um, and it's been on the lees and not just in the big um, stainless steel tanks. So let's look at the corks for um, champagne. So 
you know, I'm sure, you know, you open a bottle tonight, you, you have it, the cork right in front of you. Um, so you kind of get that little mushroom shaped cork, right? And you can see a couple of them here um, on, the, um, on the screen. So the reality is that these corks are actually um, three different pieces. Um, which is when you um, when you open a champagne or a sparkling wine bottle, you you do it by twisting the bottle, not the cork. Because if you're twisting the cork out, um, it can break on you. So on the bottom of the cork, um, you'll see that if you look very closely, and I may not be able to get this on the camera, but there's a very thin strip of cork right at the very bottom. This is um, a much higher quality cork than you'll find in the in the center of it um, or on the top, because they want this to be. Um, this is the part that's touching the wine, so they wanted the best possible cork there. And then they um, glue the rest of the cork together. A lot of times it's made out of a composite cork, um, you know, just ground up corks. Um, and so then you get um, this one big cork. And these are what they look like before they get put in the bottle. So you can see um, very clearly here that there's a line here and a line here. So this is the, the part that will touch the wine. Um, and it has to be on top and bottom because the corks may flip around in the, in the corking area uh, in the corking machine. Um, and then you can see there's a, you know, th this cork here is not as high quality because it, it has more holes and it's more porous where the, um, the bottom one is, is a much flatter um, and, and much uh, nicer cork. And so that if you did the whole cork in that way, um, it can be a lot, much more expensive. You know, some corks can go up to a buck, a buck 50 each, um, which are high end prestige champagnes will use those, um, but not most entry level ones. So um, the, um, the corks, let me go back to the previous one. You can, you can determine how long the cork has been in the bottle by the shape that it, it comes out of. So if you look at the um, picture here on the right, you can see that it starts getting fatter after you take it out because it's starting to expand back into its original shape. Where on the left, um, that's been in, in bottle much, much longer because it's, it's not going back into that um, fatter cork. It's gonna stay very narrow because it's been in that bottle so long that everything's just compressed down. So the more um, mushroom, you know, the thinner stem and the bigger cap, um, the more, more that's pronounced, you know that it's, the cork comes from an older champagne or older, older sparkling wine. If it goes back to a more um, fatter one, you know it's a fairly young uh, sparkling wine. So let's talk a little bit more about the method. Um, so if you recognize this lady here, um, the Madame Clicquois, she, um, she was one of the first women in history to actually run her own company. So that in itself is worth having her um, on here and to talk about that when her, when her husband died, um, she decided that she was going to maintain the winery and keep making wines, um, even though at that time, it was like, you know, you know, let the man do it. You know, you know, woman doesn't know how to do this. And she's like, yeah, no, what? You know, I've been here. I've been running it with my husband all these years. I can do it. So just leave me alone and get out of my way. Um, and a good thing she did, too, because you remember, as we were talking about how the sparkling wine's made, when it's put in the bottle with the yeast um, and it keeps eating the yeast and you get the lees, which are the dead yeast cells, um, you know, the longer you have it on there, the, the more rich the, and flavorful that the wine becomes. But really before Madame Coquois um, was on the scene, the wine champagnes are very cloudy because all those dead yeast were in there. And when you poured it out, it would get mixed up and you would get all of these, you know, a cloudy, cloudy wine. Um, and that was fine. You know, that's what they were accustomed to back then. But then, you know, the, the king of, of France like really liked it when it was clear, you know, so he would have the bottle sit. So all the yeast would go to the bottom and then they would pour out from the top. Um, and so the king would get the top pours because that would be the clearest of the champagnes. And then, you know, everybody else would get the bottom pours because that's where it'd be more cloudy. But uh, Madame McCroix came up with this thing called riddling. So um, she decided that I'm going to figure out how to get all of that leaves out of the bottle so that um, everybody can have a clear glass. Um, let's see, um, Kirsten has a question here, um, a cava with the vintage in it. Uh, they, they do make um, vintage cavas as well. It says method traditional, um, and that is the same as the method champonnet. It's just a different name 
for it. Um, and you'll see we have several different names, Method um, Traditional, um, Method um, Cape Classique, uh, Method Champoinat. So they're all kind of the same, they're all using the same method, they're just um, done in the same way. So um, what Madame Croix did, she decided that she's gonna figure out a way to get all of those dead cells out of the bottles so that we can um, sell clear wines. And she came up with riddling. And so what riddling is, is actually turning these bottles on upside down just about. And um, you're gonna get all of that yeast to move from, because you know when you store the bottles, you're storing them sideways like this. So all the yeast is gonna be sitting in here. So by turning it upside down, all the yeast will slowly move down. And what they do riddling is like they turn it little by little. And you can see the lines on the bottles in this picture um, that that's how they know where the bottles are. And so these are almost done. So they generally do it clockwise. So you can see they're almost back to, to uh, midnight. And so they keep turning this a little bit each day. And it takes about six weeks for this to occur. So the yeast will slowly move down into the top of the, um, of the bottle. Um, and as you can imagine, this is all done by hand. So you can look at all this. You gotta hire somebody that that's all they do is just sit there and riddle all day long. Um, and it takes an art. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, um, houses that still hand riddle, um, they've had the same person for years. Um, and, and the riddler can, can do, you know, thousands of bottles a day because they know exactly what to do. They have it down to an art. And so as you get all these in, you start seeing the, the yeast move to the top. Now that works fine if you're only making a small amount of wine. And you know, usually the, the, the top houses are only making, um, you know, the top champagne houses aren't making that much. Um, the, the, the smaller cava houses and Prosecco houses, you know, while they may make a, um, a lot of wines, uh, not Prosecco, but cava makes a lot of wines, you know, they will probably have a prestige one um, that will still be done by hand. If you're not gonna do it by hand, then you have to use something called a gyro pellet. And so here you have um, a gyro pellet and each one holds about 500 bottles. And it, what, um, what was taking six weeks can now be done in one week. And it only needs somebody to load this up. So you don't have to have any particular skill as Riddler, um, which is actually very dangerous on your wrists as well as you can imagine. Um, but you can put 500 bottles at a time and it will turn in one week and get all of the yeast down into the top of the bottle. From there, well, we're gonna figure out the next step of making wine. But um, any questions on this kava that we've been having here? Give me a chance to take a sip as well. Um, so, you know, when you, when you went and bought these, if you bought all three of them, um, the, Odds are Prosecco was probably the lowest price that you got, um, followed by the Cava, followed by the Champagne. Um, again, this goes, if you look at the overall cost structure, it's because in the Charmant method, you don't have to worry about the bottling. You don't have to worry about all of this riddling either. You just have it in a tank and you basically pour it into the bottle as you need to sell it. So you don't really have to worry about storing bottles. You don't have to worry about bottles exploding on you. Bottles still do explode. Um, it's much rarer now. Um, but most houses will tell you that they still lose, you know, one or two a month, um, where if you ever go on a tour of, of a champagne cellar, a lot of times you're going to see this mesh fence between where you walk and where the bottles are stored, um, just in case there is an explosion while um, the guest is walking by, they don't want the guests to get hurt. Um, so that is still very real happening today, not nearly as much as in Dom Perignon's day, um, you know, where they would lose a, a lot of bottles and, you know, a, a couple of monks, um, you know, quite often, so. Um, but, you know, so that's why Prosecco is cheaper. Cava, you know, um, doesn't use the tank method, but they're able to use the gyro pallet method here. Um, so they're not hand riddling everything. So this lowers the cost down tremendously as well. Also being in Spain, um, the, the labor costs are lower, so they don't have as much problem um, dealing with, with labor prices as you do in France. And you can have a lot more, um, there's a lot more areas made by um, uh, the DO Cava because you don't have it just that one small region like you do in France. 
Um, we do have a question. Are sparking wines from Europe impacted by U.S. tariffs? Um, some of them are, yes. So it depends where they come from, right? So um, I believe right now our tariffs are on French and Italian wines, um, which means if, if you bought that Prosecco and the Champagne, you, um, depending when it came into the country, uh, you know, you, you paid that um, extra 25% on that, on that wine. Um, or some portion of it, because the importers and the retailers did absorb some of those costs. Spain, um, as last I checked, did not have tariffs. So the Cava uh, may actually be cheaper than a Prosecco at this point in time, because they don't have that added tariff put onto it. Um, and if you get sparkling wines from Germany, they make a sparkling wine called Sec, um, which is made out of um, namely Riesling, but you can also find it made out of Gruner Vettliner. Um, and you know, um, Portugal makes some sparkling wines. Again, they're not, um, you can't usually find them in the US because they don't make that much of it. Um, but pretty much every country will make a sparkling wine now. Um, but whether it's imported into the US or not, you know, that's another issue, so. So um, one more sip here. So here's the, um, the finished thing. So after it comes out of the gyro palette or the hand riddling, you have the bottle. Remember I told you it had that crown cap on there that you would find in beers. And all of the leaves have now, because um, we had the bottle upside down, you have a whole bunch right here, right? So these are all the, the leaves. And so what they do is they put them on um, a machine or you can do it by hand. Um, I know Dr. Constantine Frank up in, in um, uh, the Finger Lakes, they still do it by hand. So what they do is they take, take these bottles and they dip it in freezing water, um, saline or glycerin uh, today, you know, you know, it can be a chemical and it instantly freezes um, this part of the bottle. And so what happens then is that they pop the cork off and because of the pressure, this, the frozen yeast gets thrown out immediately. And so it just clean comes out. And so then all you have left in there are, um, is the wine, the sparkling wine. Um, at this point, then they add a little bit more sugar in there and that will determine what kind of wine they're gonna be, what kind of sparkling wine they're gonna have. So you have that Brut Nacho, um, which is zero to three grams of sugar per liter. Um, so if you think about it, it's, there's hardly anything in there, zero to three um, in a bottle is, um, and actually a bottle is only 750 milliliters, so it's not even a full liter. So you're not gonna get that much sweetness. It's gonna be very dry. And then you go to extra brut, brut, um, extra dry, dry, demi-sec, and dua. Um, so the dua is gonna be a very sweet, because you get 50 plus um, grams of sugar per liter. So it's gonna be a very sweet sparkling wine. Then you also have, um, so you have all these different levels. So when you go see them in the store, you can see what um, level you're getting. So, at, but if you notice that at the top three, they kind of um, overlap one another, zero to three, zero to six, zero to 12. It's not till you get to extra dry where there's an international standard for it. So what they do is uh, at these is where you, um, it comes more marketing comes into play. So in a more health conscious country, you may go with a Brut uh, Natra because that is going to be less sugar added. So therefore, technically less calories will be in there. Um, all the way up, you know, you can go up to 12 grams of sugar and still call it a brute. Um, so if you're very famous for your brute wines and one year you don't get as much added in there, you might only get, you know, eight in there, that's fine. Even if you get six, not a problem. When you get to the extra brute and the brute, you have to be very careful of how much sugar you add in there. In this dosage, which is what they do once that um, all the yeast is, is spelled out, is where um, this dosage of the sugar, um, it can be grape must, you know, it, it's gonna be some kind of grape related. It's not gonna be just pure sugar that you buy off the store shelf. It's gonna be a grape must um, that they're gonna put in there to add more flavor. And this is also, there's gonna be some secrets um, in that dosage because it's gonna make what we call the house style. Um, so that's what makes um, the difference is not just between the, um, the, the vineyards where the, where the actual grapes came from to begin with, but also the house can make a different style. So you, you will know that this is a Dom Perignon, this is a um, Paul Regier. So whatever that is, they have their particular style and some may be known for being a little bit sweeter. Some may have a hint of, 
this, a hint of that, and that's where they're going to do this is in, in this um, secret dosage that they're going to put together. So um, for the next one, I have a, a fourth bottle here I'm going to uh, open for you. And I'm not gulping the wine, as some people in the chat are saying. I have smaller glasses than the others are drinking it out of. So, so I'm going to open next here is an MCC. There we go. So MCCs come from South Africa. Um, let's see if I can get it up there for you. So this is a Graham Beck. Um, you can see it says Brut, so you know it's less than 12 grams of, of um, sugar in here. Um, and Pat wants me to start savoring these off. <laughs> um, so this is actually one of my go-to sparklers. I do love the Graham Beck. Um, as a lot of you know, we travel to South Africa quite often. Um, we have three tours going next year, so we'll talk more about that later. Um, but we, we do drink a lot of Graham Beck when we're there. So MCC Method Cap Classic um, means that it's, um, it's made in the classic method, which is Method Champoignat. But um, the South Africans wanted to put something in there, and, you know, and they're known as you know, Cape Town, the Cape. Um, so they want to have um, Meta Cape Classic. So um, it's made in the same way as champagne is, um, the Meta Champoignat, same way as Cava. Um, but it's not the, um, um, it, it, they just have their own little spin on the name so that you will recognize. If you see something that says MCC, you will always know it comes from South Africa. Um, so these are made um, also with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, sometimes in South Africa, you will also find um, MCC made with um, Chenin Blanc, um, as you also will in France. In the Loire Valley, you'll also find sparkling um, wine made with uh, Chenin Blanc. Um, but in France, again, um, if it's not made in Champagne, you can't call it Champagne. So if it's made elsewhere in France, um, you'll see it called a Cremant, um, which is just another name for Method Champonnet. It's made in the same way, but you just can't call it Champagne. Everything Champagne must come from the Champagne region just like the Cavas, if, you know, there are other parts of Spain that do make Cava, but if, if they're not in one of those um, areas that's the Dio Cava, they cannot call it Cava, so it would just be a sparkling wine. So this one, it's getting, um, the ones I picked out are getting more and more richer, more and more full body, and you're getting more of that, hmm, there's good acid in this one too. Um, you're getting more of those um, baking spices, right? Because um, you want them to, um, it's integrating with, with, the, with the leaves that are sitting in there. And so over, you know, the longer it sits on those leaves, the more and more pronounced those flavors are going to be in, in your wines. Um, so here's a picture of um, the dosage being added. So, you, you know, you can see that the, the dead yeast cells are now missing from here. Um, so they've been thrown out, and in this particular machine, this is a, a machine at Grand Beck. Um, you know, it gets the dosage added in, and then from here, it's going to be corked. It'll have the cage put on there. It's the cage just to make sure that the wine is um, not going to force the cork out of the bottle. So that's why you always have the cage on there, and then. Um, it gets laid down again um, because like most wines, you know, once you bottle it, you don't necessarily want to drink it immediately. You want to let it rest a little bit and get, um, uh, you know, just let it, you know, settle down and, and not get um, uh, overexcited by all of the stuff that's happened to it. Um, see, there was no, let me see. Um, <laughs> Uh, Marlene's on our way over to um, come up, come over and get the leftover sparklings. Yes, so um, there she's having a Loire Cremant with the steak and mashed potatoes and mushrooms with onions and garlics. That sounds really good. Um, if you come over, Marlene, bring some of that with you. We'll trade you sparkling wine for steak and mushrooms. Um, so let's see. Um, so like I said, you want these bottles to lay down. So what happens here is that they lay down and they'll stay here, you know, again, depending how long 
um, de depending on the house. But since there's no yeast in there, there's not going to be a whole lot of more development. And so they're just going to lay down for a little while and then they'll get shipped out. Um, which means that um, if you look at some of the vintage um, champagnes and vintage cabas, if you look on the back of the label, there's usually going to be what they call a disgorge date. And disgorging is when we take these um, you disgorge the, the, the leaves come out of that, um, out of the bottle, that's disgorgement. And so after disgorgement, there's literally not a whole lot um, left for the wine to develop because you've kind of cleaned out everything that's going to be adding more to it. So um, you're just laying them down to kind of settle down and to rest. Um, same thing, you know, when you buy a wine, you should let it sit and rest a little bit a day or two um, before you start drinking it. Um, it's called bottle shock, right? We all we all saw that movie um, about um, the judgment of Paris and the bottle shock can be real um, on your wines. So after the disgorgement, um, you need to kind of drink the wines, um, which, you know, in in the Charmant method that you see in, um, in, in uh, Prosecco, those wines are kept under pressure and on the lees until demand. So when, they're, when somebody needs to buy more Prosecco, um, you know, they, they empty out a tank and fill up all the bottles and ship them out. So you have that ready to go. In Champagne um, and, and Cava and, and a lot of the US sparkling wines, it's done, um, the bottles are just set down somewhere in a warehouse in a cellar at, at cellar temperatures. Um, and allowed to sit on the on the lees until um, generally until the the winemaker decides these are now ready to drink. Um, you know certainly in, in in Champagne and and now in Cava with the new rules, um, if you're going for a Reserva, Grand Reserva, something like that, there's a certain minimum time that they must sit there, um, but it doesn't have to be all the time. Um, so let's, um, let's see what's next here. Oh, let's not go back. So um, let me um, finish off. Got too many glasses over here. So I'm going to finish off. Um, the last one I have here is a true champagne, which again can only come from the champagne region. Um, and it's um, one of my favorite houses. And I'll show you the picture here. Um, Paul Regere. Um, this is um, what you would call their entry level champagne. Um, so there are several different types of champagnes in champagne. Um, this is the house, the house one. And these, these are the ones that you'll find in most stores. You'll see that the house brands. Um, Paul Roger makes um, also one of my favorites. Their prestige um, bottling is called Sir Winston Churchill and it was named after Sir Winston Churchill. Um, Winston Churchill was a great, great lover of champagne. Um, and while he was the, um, um, the prime minister of, of um, Britain after the war, or even during the war, because um, he had, had a lot shipped over, um, he would drink um, a couple of cases a month of Paul Regere. And so when he passed away, uh, they worked with um, the Churchill estate to create the prestige um, bottling at um, a Poirier called Sir Winston Churchill. Now that only comes out every couple of years. They just released last year, um, the 2008 vintage. They don't make it every year, um, but they just released the 2008. Um, and so that one is now ready to drink. Trying to open this up. There we go. Um, and it, it is among my favorites, but um, it does come at a price. Um, you are looking for prestige bottles of paying at least $250 to $300 for a bottle of Sir Winston Churchill. Um, whereas for the entry level Paul Regere, um, you can get this for around 45 to 50, depending where you are. Um, let me see, I have a question here from Stephanie. What is the name of sparkling wines made with Riesling or Chenin Blanc? Um, so when it's made with Riesling, it's generally called sect. S-E-K-T. Um, you can find it. Um, I do um, see it um, at Total Wine. They do carry it. Um, you, you may have to ask for it or you know, search for it because you know, most of the wines in, in Total Wine, you're going to see the champagnes, the cavas, and the proseccos. Um, but there's usually a shelf somewhere else that will have some of the other wines as well. Um, so look for SEKT, S-E-K-T. Um, and that will be either from Germany or Austria. 
Those are the two that are the biggest producers of sect. And then the Chenin Blanc um, one, uh, well, uh, again, you know, depending where it's from, if it's from South Africa, it would still be called an MCC. Um, but if you're looking for a Chenin Blanc from the Loire Valley, um, it will be called a Cremant. K -R, uh, sorry, C-R-E-M-A-N-T, Cremant. Um, and again, it's made in the same method, but they just can't call it a champagne because it's not a champagne. Um, and you can find, uh, there's quite a few Cremants also at Total Wine um, and also check your local um, wine shop. Um, they may have a little bit better quality ones um, than um, Total Wine carries um, from the smaller producers. And um, so, yeah, so there we go, got that. So um, in addition to the big houses that we all know in, in um, Champagne, Paul Régier, Bollinger, um, Vu uh, Madame Clacroix, Vu Clacroix, um, the um, Dom Perignon, Moyet, um, those are all big houses. Um, and what happens is, you know, they tend to buy their grapes from the growers and everything. Um, and so some of the growers are like, well, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're taking our grapes and you're making great wines and you're selling them for $300 a bottle. Um, why don't um, we do some of that here? So now you are starting to see more and more of what we call grower champagne. Um, these are champagnes made by the growers themselves. And so they actually, um, what we would call maybe an estate wine now because the grapes are grown and the wine's made all in the same location. Um, whereas a lot of the big houses, you know, they'll get the grapes from everywhere. So it's not truly estate um, wines, um, except maybe the prestige is probably, um, most of those do come from estate vineyards. Um, but uh, the growers said, you know, hey, can we get in on this? And I've been fortunate to been to a couple of different conferences um, with the, um, where the growers have been uh, uh, exhibiting and they are making some phenomenal, phenomenal wines. Um, they're on price a little bit lower than um, the big houses because they realize that they have to compete with the big houses um, and they don't have the name recognition, but they also don't have all the marketing um, prices that they have to deal with that, you know, you, you know, you're starting to see all these commercials now on TV for, you know, for your sparking wines. And so somebody pays for all that marketing, right? And it's um, usually us who are buying these wines. Um, the growers don't necessarily have that, um, that that um, added cost. And so they're able to save on that. Um, and they kind of band together. You will see grower champagne um, presentations and uh, conferences and everything where a bunch of growers will get together and come and present their wines to the public. Um, again, they're made in the method, Champagne uh, method. Um, so it's gonna be made in the same way as any of these other champagnes are. Um, and sometimes maybe even with the same grapes that some of the others are made with. Um, they can't tell you, they'll never, um, because they don't wanna um, get the big houses um, upset with them, but they will still make um, their own wines. They'll hold back, you know, maybe a ton of grapes instead of they sold everything off to the big houses, they'll keep back a ton of grapes and use those to make their wines. And so therefore, you know, you can get just as good a quality if not better. Um, and you can also then all, um, save a little bit of money and also help the smaller businessmen as well, right? Which in, in this year, you know, it, it's the big um, push to, you know, keep your, your small businesses, your local businesses in, in business um, because they really need the help. Um, let me see what um, some stuff's going on in the chat here. Ooh, hold on. Um, hey, where's the Asti? Um, so I didn't do an Asti on this one. Um, that does come from Italy. Um, it's not, it doesn't have as much pressure in it as um, uh, th these um, sparking wines will do. Um, so these, these sparking wines will have about three atmospheres of pressure in the wines. Um, so be very careful when you open these. Um, when you do open it, you know, like I said, twist the bottle you, and keep the Keep the cage on the cork when you're opening the bottle because it gives you more um, um, grasping if, with, than the, just the cork. So you'll be able to hold on to those metal pieces and slowly turn the bottle um, until you get the cork out. And try to keep the bottle at a 45 degree angle as you're doing it. And of course, point it away from anybody um, because you can imagine a minimum of three atmospheres all the way up to five atmospheres for, for some of the better champagnes. Um, that cork can go flying um, and can be quite dangerous. Um, you know, I, I, um, so as many of you know, we go to Wolf Trap 
every year in every normal year. Um, and I can can't tell you the number of times that we see these corks going flying across the lawn um, because people are just opening opening up and not worrying about the atmospheres that are in there. And um, I have not seen anybody hurt, but I do know that people do get hurt um, quite often opening up some of these uh, wines. Um, let's see, Anne-Marie, she's enjoying the Revento Zibank. Um, um, from the dynasty of the creator of the first Cava, uh, Joseph Reventes. Um, yeah, he, he did leave um, Cava to create geographically specific appellations, uh, Conca de Rio Anoya, delicious, and of course, Meta Trashina Blanc de Blanc. So let me mention Blanc de Blanc. Thank you, Henry, for bringing that up. Blanc de Blanc means white from white, right? So sometimes you'll see that on these labels, and what that means is that it's made completely from probably Chardonnay. It can also be Chenin Blanc in certain areas, um, but it's gonna be made only from white grapes. Um, so Blanc de Blanc means white from white. You also will see Blanc de Noir, which means um, white from black. And so that's made with some red grapes. Um, primarily Pinot Noir is the biggest red grape that's used in Champagne. Um, and as you remember, when you squeeze most grapes, um, white or red, the juice is clear, it is not red juice coming out of a red grape and white juice coming out of a white grape. Um, that happens for a couple of grapes called Tintura grapes, but um, as far as I know, none of those are used in sparkling wines. There may be somebody um, out there who knows um, one that is doing that, um, but I've not, I've not seen a, a sparkling a la Camp Bouchette or something like that. Um, can't be, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I've not seen it. Um, so for the most part, you're gonna see them um, Blanc de Noir, which means it's going to have just, um, it's going to be made from uh, a, a red grape. And so it'll have a little bit more body. Uh, and actually something we learned uh, a couple um, episodes back when we had um, a, a winemaker from Cava on the show, she said that the, the, the Pinot Noir actually gives it more bubbles, um, that the, the proteins, the Pinot Noir allow the wine to have more bubbles than if you're using a Blanc de Blanc, which is why she preferred to use a Blanc de Noir. I am um, going to test it out one of these days, um, pouring the two out and see which one actually have the most bubbles in it. Um, now, you can also have a red sparkling wine. Australia does make the sparkling Shiraz. Um, it's been a number of years since I had it because they tend to, tend to be fairly sweet. Um, but I understand now that they're making some of them dry. And so you will see some um, drier um, sparkling Shirazes um, in Australia. I've not seen any in the States. Um, Australia also um, in Tasmania makes a very good sparkling wine um, made with Chardonnay and um, Pinot Noir. Um, so those are going to be very good as well. Mm. Finishing up my, um, um, this is the Prosecco, because I can still get that fruitiness on there. So finish that off so I can move on to my Paul Régère. Let's see, any questions? Ah, yeah, grower champagne, yes. Pat, um, you know, it's always good to try these grower champagnes. You know, I was um, I was in Hong Kong last year for Vinex um, Pro Wine Hong Kong, and the the grower uh, champagne um, group had a huge huge area there, and we were able to try oh, probably two or three dozen different grower champagnes, and they were all delicious. Um, so I'm really interested in um, trying more and more of those. So let's try the last one now. I have a champagne. Is the Paul Riger? Again, I'll show you that again. Just there we go, Paul Riger. And um, again, this is made. This is the champagne. This is their house champagne. Um, if um, if I could afford it, it would be my house champagne as well, but um, we cannot afford this on a daily basis. Um, but you get a lot more of those um, uh, yeast and baking spices, um, sometimes even a little sweet, a little, um, you know, uh, sweet baking spices as well. And so, I mean, that's part of what, you know, laying on the leaves for at least three years. Uh, let me see if I can see if they have a disgorgement date on this one. It's not a vintage, so it may not have it on there. Let me see. Um, 
No, it does not, because it's not a vintage. So if it's a vintage, it would have a disgorgement date on it. Um, let's see, and Andrew's saying that Casanel in Virginia does make a sparkling red. I did not know that. Um, and uh, Early Mountain, yes, Early Mountain just did release uh, their first sparkling. I was actually there um, ooh, about a month ago, um, and we were able to try some of their sparkling, and it was very nice as well. Um, and we'll have... Um, we do have uh, a couple of sparking folks coming up on the show next year. Um, we'll be starting off in February, I believe, with Schramsberg, um, which is the U.S. sparkling wine out of California. Um, and it is um, the wine that is generally served at the White House. Um, it, um, uh, it, they're beautiful, beautiful wines. Um, a little bit more pricey than some of the other sparking wines made in the U.S., um, but well worth it. Um, and so we will have um, the winemaker, uh, Mr. Davies will be on to join us um, and we will have um, a couple of his sparkling wines. So um, uh, be sure and uh, watch for that. It's um, in February, right before Valentine's Day. So I wanted to make sure you knew what to, what to do. Um, let's see what else is popping up in here. Um, da, da, da. Lambrusco is another sparking wine made in, in um, Italy, as well as French Accorta. Um, as you can see, there's many different out there. I just have, I just didn't have enough time. We could spend, you know, five hours, 10 hours talking about sparking wines. Um, I do know we're going to put together a tour of sparking wines in Italy. So watch for that. I'm not sure when it's going to be now. Is Roger going to be in 22, but it's probably going to be pushed to 23 at this point. Um, we're going to call that the Angela tour um because i know she will um be right on the top of it um so yeah so these are very good mm. i can drink paul Regier all day so um are there any final questions here we're um oh yeah we're past seven o'clock now um plus two with angela on the sparking italian wine tour there we go kirsten will come along as well so that'll be fun so I do want to um, remind you, so next week, we're going to have um, Ugiano um, on our um, show. Giacomo is going to be talking about um, some of his wines, um, uh, some Chianti's in there. So um, one of my favorites in the world. Um, it will be at five o'clock instead of six o'clock next week because um, he didn't want to stay up too late. So I agreed to go ahead and start it a little bit earlier. So you may have to leave work a little bit earlier or shut down your computer a little bit earlier. The week after that, right before Christmas, um, we're going to have rots, which as you know, was supposed to be this week, but because of all the big storms up in New York, they could not get the wines out of the warehouse to the distributors. Um, so um, we did um, talk with him and postpone it to December 17. And so um, uh, please come and try that out. There are gonna be some phenomenal Chenin Blanc and some phenomenal Cab Franc um, as well. Um, and this is a, a winery that we visit all the time when we're in, in South Africa. It's one of our favorites. Um, and it, they, he just makes some beautiful wines. And then we're going to take a couple of weeks off um, because, as you know, we do this on Thursdays and, you know, we have to deal with um, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. And we'll be drinking a lot of sparklers on New Year's Eve. So you can check us out on Instagram and Facebook. You'll be able to see what we're drinking. Um, but then we come back on January 7th and we'll be our first uh, show of the new year with Bella Vineyards and Wine Caves out of um, California. Um, and they make some beautiful Zinfandels. Um, so we're going to go um, start off the new year with a some really big wines, um, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy them. So you can check out all of those um, on our website, alifefulldrunk.com slash tastings, um, and see what's coming up. And uh, you can order the wines. Um, you can still order the wines for Rots. Um, for uh, Ujano, it's uh, no longer able to order those wines, but you can still order wines for um, Rots. But be sure and do that very quickly, um, because as you know, um, during the holiday season, Shipping um, times just are getting stretched out. Um, and if you're also interested in Bella, go ahead and order those now because it's gonna be dragged out quite a bit. And the links to order all of those you can find um, on our website as well. Um, and you'll also be getting emails, so. And I did tell you we're gonna talk about what trips we're gonna be going on. So in 2021, um, if all goes well around August, um, after everybody gets their vaccinations, 
um, two of them, remember, one and two. Um, we're going to try to do a tour out to Napa, Sonoma. Um, so that will um, visit some of our friends who um, we've been helping on, on our show here. We're going to go out and visit them, and you'll be able to meet them in person and drink their wines right on the estates themselves. And then also um, in September, October, uh, we have our tours to South Africa. Um, tour one is sold out. We still have some room on two and a little bit of room on three. Um, um, but if you're interested in those, please reach out to me, um, send me an email, and I'll be happy to give you more information on those. In 22, we are looking at um, doing our Budapest Vienna Prague tour, which should have been done earlier this year, um, but it got pushed back into 22 now. Um, we also have a South America tour of um, Chile, um, Argentina, and Uruguay. And of course, we always do Napa Sonoma. And then um, we'll also do a fortified wine tour. So just like that sparkling wine tour of Italy, where we'll visit the Lambruscos, the French Quarters, and the Proseccos, um, we're going to do a fortified wine where we'll go to Jerez to try sherry, off to Porto to have port, and um, Madeira to have some Madeiras. And so it's going to be an all fortified wines. Um, so it's going to be... Um, uh, yeah, keep your liver healthy so you can get out to those. So, so um, if there are any other questions here, I'll look and see. I don't see any other questions in any of the rooms. So everybody, thank you for joining me. Um, we'll see you next week for some great Italian wines. Um, and I'm going to have to make something to go with it because um, there's going to be some really good counties in there. So everybody, um, you take care, um, stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.